This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, there's nothing like Randy kind of preaching your sermon before you get to it. Um, today's message is entitled, Fighting to Establish God's Will. And, you know, the last few weeks have been hard. It's where there's a, a somberness because we have lost some generals in the kingdom of God. And... Uh, I don't think that we know just exactly what levels the occult did to get that done. And we need to realize that we are in hostile territory. You know, it's human nature that when something bad happens, we try to comfort ourselves by saying, well, this must have been the will of God. But is that really what the Bible teaches? You know, I think part of the problem can be traced back to an overemphasis on the teachings of John Calvin. Uh, predestination can be taken to the place that it covers everything that happens in life, which was not the intent of John Calvin. What he was trying to do is to overcome an erroneous teaching by the Catholic Church that in a wave of a magic wand, they could take everybody's salvation away. It's called excommunication. And during the Reformation, uh, he was finding refuge in, in uh, Germany because the uh, king of Germany, or Austria, whatever it was called back then, uh, wanted to be pope and they didn't make him pope, so he became, a, he became a Protestant and gave refuge to the reformers. And so the Catholic's response was, and this, this was common during the Reformation, we excommunicate Everyone in that country, you're all now going to hell. And the only way to salvation is to overthrow your king and install one that's favorable to the Catholic Church. Then everybody gets to come back in and you get to go to heaven. And so he came up with predestination, the whole concept of that, although it's only mentioned a couple of times in the Bible. And it has to be taken in balance with God's foreknowledge you have to kind of understand temporal mechanics and a few other things to really understand what Paul was talking about. But we seem to think, well, this was the will of God because it happened. Let me tell you something. There are billions of things that happened just today on planet Earth that was not the will of God. It was the will of another God, little g. Okay. I want to start out in just some basic scriptures we should all know. John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come for it except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And there's a dichotomy here. God's will is that we would have divine life, that we would move in the kingdom of God, that we would have the life of God. But there's another kingdom operating that Jesus called a thief, which is seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. So there are two wills being manifested in the earth. Two. And I think sometimes we forget that. 
In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, Paul writes these words, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded. God did not blind them. The God of this world blinded them. Okay? Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. And so he was saying, listen, there is a God little g of this earthly system that has been in place ever since Adam fell, that is laboring 24-7, 365 to keep humanity under thumb, to keep it in desperation, to kill and steal and destroy it, and to keep it from salvation and the kingdom of God. Okay? That's exactly what it... And why is this so important? Because in Paul in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, he reveals to us the will of God concerning salvation. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth. Now this word in the Greek, uh, thaleo, can either be, it can, it's, it's number one translation is will. God wills that all men be saved. It can be will, have in mind, to intend, to be involved, to determine, to purpose. It even goes as far as to say wish. How I many know God didn't wish? <laughs> he works. But it is, in fact, in the authorized version, it is translated in the New Testament 159 times as will or would. And then it's translated 16 times as will or could. But it's showing that it is God's will that everybody gets saved. It's God's will that the chairman of China gets saved. It's God's will that every communist gets saved. It's God's will that Washington, D.C. gets saved. It's God's will that every single man, woman, and child on planet Earth gets saved. But there is another God, little g, that is laboring to keep them from that salvation. We sometimes forget the war. Now, just in dealing in God's will, if you look it up in any systematic theology, what they will tell you is there are two versions of the will of God in the earth. One is His perfect will. How many like that one? Everybody's healed, everybody's saved, everybody's blessed. But there's another one called the permissive will of God. And this is dealing with those in covenant with Him. Because you got a chooser, okay? And many times our chooser is stuck on stupid. Yeah, so you want a king. Well, there's one guy named Lot that we see a perfect example of the permissive will of God. And this is found in Genesis chapter 19, verses 17 through 20. It says, and so when it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, speaking of the angels that took him and his family outside of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me tell you something. When God destroys something, it goes beyond an atomic weapon. I have uh, seen videos and actually talked to people that have been to the place that we know as Sodom and Gomorrah. And there are pyramid-like structures, there's mountain faces and everything, that God's judgment reduced all of it to ash, that you can walk up to a mountain and put your arm into it. Because it's nothing but ash. And there's bits and pieces of sulfur, really bad sulfur, all the brimstone. And I heard one guy said he brought some of that back and made the mistake of lighting it in his basement. It ran him out of the house. Just a little piece, okay? When God decimates something. And so beyond an atomic bomb, beyond an atomic weapon, down to the molecular level, turning everything to ash, the angels are escorting them out. And, it's, and, uh, and then it says, and he said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. So God told the angel, you go down there and you get Lot and his family. You tell him, get to the mountains. That's the will of God. But how many know for an old man that's used to living in a plain, 
Mountains are hard to climb. Okay? Then Lot said to them, Oh, please no, my lords. No, this is the will of God. I'm getting ready to vaporize this. Head to the mountains. Oh, no. Indeed, now your servants are found favor in your sight, that we may increase your mercy, which, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. Now see this city near is enough to flee to, and it's just a little one. It's just a little city, Mr. Bill. Okay. It's not as bad as Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just a little city. Please let me escape there, and my soul shall live. Now when you read on in the story, and they, and they see the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, or they hear it, they don't see it because they can't look at it. And I mean, I've, I bet they just the sound of it was terrifying. He gets down to that city, and it's evil. It's like a little Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes, oh man, what does he do? He flees to the mountains. <laughs> exactly where God told him to go in the first place. God's permissive will allowed him to, but because there was covenant involved, eventually he got around to doing what God told him to begin with. And how many of us is that our story? How many times has God said, this is what I want done? And we go, oh man. You know, I, I, and, we, and we, we start bartering with God. You know, I, this would be easier and this would be easier. And sometimes we stop up our ears and I ain't going to listen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have said in my mind I'm going to do this. And God says, I got your number. And eventually things get worse and worse and worse because God knew that plan A was so much better than our plan B. That eventually, and guys, for some people, it can take years. How many of us have known loved ones that have run from God for years when he handed everything to them almost on a silver platter? And they run. But many times in their old age, they end up being exactly where God told them to be, but then mourn over the wasted years. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So we have, we have two things going on. Satan and his kingdom does not want any of God's will to be done in the earth and is fighting tooth and nail. Every, priest of dar every priesthood of darkness member is laboring to see to it that the will of God is overturned in the earth. And then you have us that sometimes get stuck on stupid and we say, oh, but Lord, when we have a God who only wants the very best for us. But it goes on even more than that. And let's, let's go to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I, I just want to zone here on 2 and, and bring out some things. You know, before I could read Greek, I used to think this meant that you could prove the will of God by God's will being manifested in your life. And you're saying, see, there's proof it was the will. That's not what it's talking about here when you get into the Greek. He says, now I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, here, now do not be conformed to this world. The world is moving in the will of Lucifer, every bit of it. Can you see it on the streets of America today? I can see it in the universities. I can see it in Washington, D.C. I can see it everywhere. And unfortunately, it's also being manifested in a lot of churches today because we've lost our way. It says, now don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that. Now here's, here's where the, the, the clincher is. Only a renewed mind can scrutinize a situation and find out what God's will is. This word prove in the Greek means to test, examine, prove, scrutinize, to see whether a thing is genuine or not, or as you would test metals. I remember I had a, I've got a brother, he's now in ministry, but I guess him and, and his brothers were trouble when they were younger. And... Uh, 
And they found out that you could actually get a little stamp that said, you know, 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold. And they'd go find fake jewelry and they'd stamp it with that and try to take it into the pawn shop, see if they could get the price of real gold for it. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing about it is gold is not magnetic. It will, it will not, it will not re respond at all to a magnet. And so all the... The clerk would do is he would pull out a magnet to prove that jewelry, and, and I don't care how many times they stamped that thing, 18 karat gold, that thing was picked up by the magnet every time. It looked pretty, it looked wonderful. I mean, they polished that stuff up, it just gleamed like it was the most wonderful gold. But yet when it was proven, it was found short because that clerk had renewed his mind to the fact that... Uh, he, a magnet would test it out. How many times in our lives and situations around us have we renewed our minds enough to be able to discern that event over there was not the will of God? Or the situation that I'm in, and I've got this fork in the road, which one is the will of God? That comes from a renewed mind. And one of the reasons that I, I share that, I mean, we, we've lost friends and colleagues the last couple of weeks, and uh, they all hit hard, but some of them, there was, there was something else to the hitting in the morning, and it was, this wasn't the will of God. This was not the will of God. And it makes us aware of the warfare that we're in. We are, we are in a time that the iniquity of force is in ascendancy. That we are admonished by the Apostle Paul, don't be like the world. Don't get caught up in the things that they get caught up in. One of the ones that just blow me away, you know, I, I have to edit my own video and it hurts. <laughs> you know, and, and Mary and I, it's, it's like the other one of us, want to mess with our photographs and stuff. I've got to do them for some, for some of the things. I'm just, you know, some people spend hours just getting the right shot. I'll just get it done, get it up. I don't care. They, they, they can look at me, but I don't, I don't want to mess with that. This is, uh, I tell you what, this, this editing my video is, is hard. Why did you say it this way? Why didn't you say it that way? Why did you rub your nose? Made it look like you picked your nose and it's all on film. <laughs> this is all this constant stuff. And so, God, in his wisdom, we have PowerPoint slides. I could just pull it up over the, or, or sometimes I, I miss said something, so I had to cut the film. And, and so to hide the fact that I go like this, the next minute I'm like this, you just simply put up a slide. <laughs> but I'll be the first to, to, to tell you, it hurts editing my videos. I don't want to sit there and have to stare at myself for an hour to two hours to get it done. But yet, narcissism has taken over society. I mean, everybody is narcissistic to the nth degree. Let's just, let's just take two cases. The selfie. I was reading a story. This one girl was so excited that they, they're going to have a one uh, terabyte iPhone come out. Because she had a 256 gigabyte iPhone. That's a lot of space. And that's what I have because I like to download lots of audiobooks to listen to and they take up a lot of space. And they said, well, my goodness, girl, what did you fill that phone up with? Pictures of me. And I mean, we, we have devices. That way we can put our phone on a stick. We have people that are so consumed with getting the perfect shot of themselves. Guys, they're falling off of cliffs. And one guy, because I, I forgot how many millions of hits he got on YouTube. He survived, but he made sure that he clicked all the way down. And posted it on YouTube. And I'm thinking, ay, ay, boy. Well, that's enough about me. Let's talk about me and how about me. Have you heard of something called cancel culture? That is rooted in narcissism in that 
how dare you have a different opinion than mine and I must expunge your voice off the planet because you dare to have a different opinion than I do. Now over the years as a minister, what I have found is opinions are like belly buttons. <laughs> but swallow my cough drop. Some are deeper than others. Some are just full of lint. Okay. But everybody has one. Doesn't mean it's right. Everybody is entitled to their opinion until you get and stand before the Creator and you find out whose opinion really mattered. And I, I usually start every prayer with, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. Because I have an opinion, okay? But what made Jesus... Now, Jesus shifted things when he came and, and walked among us. The Pharisees would pray, and you're lucky if anything happened. They were busy about building their own little kingdoms. The Pharisees would gang up on the Sadducees, who ganged up on the, on the scribes to see which ones could get the most attention and the most bandwidth and, and social media of the time. And Jesus comes along, and, and everybody's saying, boy, he preaches with authority. He doesn't do what these guys do. And so his disciples came to him and said, you know, uh, the other religious leaders are praying, but they don't get much further prayers. You know what I mean? It's like nothing's happening. And so we want you to teach us how to pray because we've noticed when you pray and you come back, hell flees. We all know it, but have we really examined it? Our Father who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He started out with reverence for God. It wasn't about self. How I many know? Forgive me of my sins and take care of my daily needs is way down on the chart. But then he, he shares something that is so easy to overlook in, in Matthew 6 and 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have a globe that is moving in a kingdom of darkness that have their own administrators, their own tormentors, their own everything. And they've got this world pretty sewn up. Jesus comes down and says, Lord, bring your kingdom. Which is opposite of this. But then he twinned it with the will of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Kingdom is a manifestation of the will and authority and dominion of the king of that kingdom. And daily he was praying for God's kingdom to come so that it would establish his will. That's spiritual warfare. We've got to fight to bring back in the kingdom and the will of God in the earth because humanity has abandoned it for the doctrines of devils and of self and of every ism that is out there because all of it is like a hydra that leads back to the devil himself. Because their priests of darkness are working all the time to enforce their kingdom. All the time. In fact, just recently, Steve Quayle, Randy was talking about a video he just saw from him. He said, you don't know how many blood sacrifices it took to get Russ. No, we don't. We don't. I do know that when Mary and I were fighting COVID and just the exhaustion. There was a spiritual aspect to it. And it didn't begin to change until one day I was sitting in my chair and God says, rebuke the weakness. And I could feel it begin starting lifting the moment I did that. So much so I, I told Mary about it. I said, I, I just rebuked this, this weakness and I can feel it beginning to lift. That if this thing was cooked up in a laboratory. It's watch your technology. There will be a spiritual 
component to it. Anytime you do any type of chimeric creation, you will have the spirit of the watchers involved with it. And I tell you what, it is some powerful stuff. And so I think God is calling us to up our game. I want to show you something interesting out of Luke chapter 10 and verse 9. Now he's sending out his disciples to go minister in surrounding villages. And he said, to heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. In other words, he commissioned his disciples in his name to carry the kingdom that he had been praying all night to, to be released in the earth. And they carried the kingdom, and when the kingdom brushed up next to them, it's come near to you, sickness left. Now that tells me two different things. Number one, you don't have to be fully in the kingdom to see the will of God manifested. It can get your attention this way. And number two, that sickness was not the will of God because when God's kingdom came, it left. I want you to think about that for a minute. How many things are we tolerating because we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to adjust our paradigm and we're accepting things as the will of God when they're not and we should be fighting them and say, Lord, bring the kingdom. Because when the kingdom comes, then the will of God is manifested and it overwrites, it usurps, it drives out the will of the enemy. You say, but Mike, that's hard. No. It's not. How many of us are saved? It was not the will of the enemy for you to get saved. And I guarantee you all of hell tried every trick in the book to keep you out. Everything from salvation should be downhill. But the truth is, you weren't the one fighting for you to be saved. There were a whole bunch of other people fighting for you to be saved, and you didn't even know there was a war going on. How many people, if we only knew how many people fasted and prayed for our salvations that we don't even know about, maybe, maybe disbelievers that we had met on the street and the Holy Spirit says, start praying for that person to get saved. I remember listening to the testimony of Bob Mumford and he had gotten saved and as a young child and I mean his father's friends just made him his life hell on earth. And he got to the place where he went out and field and says, I don't want it anymore. I can't take this anymore. And he said the he said, you could just feel God kind of leaving him. And then he went in the, in the Navy. And let me tell you something. Backslidden believers make the worst drunks. He'd get drunk and start telling them how they all needed Jesus and how they all needed to go to church and, 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 and how you need to quit sleeping with that woman and go home to your wife and all this other stuff. And he said, about got to the place where they wouldn't even invite him to go out and drink anymore. He, had, he was a lonely drunk. And he said, one day he did, God worked it out where he did go to church. And he was a part of the White Knuckle Club resisting the call of God. And he said there was a woman up front in the church began, and literally fell on her knees and began to, to cry out and groan. He said almost like she was giving birth. And he said as she began to travail before God, he said he felt that burden and that resistance begin to lift off of him. And he ran to the altar. You see, from our side, getting saved was easy. 
but we did it on the shoulders of countless saints that prayed us in. That was the most resistance that you're ever going to have of the kingdom of God manifesting in your life. The difference once you get saved is now you're a part of the kingdom of God and now it's your burden to pray, not somebody else. And many times it takes a lot of us. But we can't pray unless we are, unless we are cognizant of the true warfare going on. The warfare is not a virus. It is a kingdom that wants to wipe out humanity. I think it's empowering a regime over in China that enslaves its own people and would like to have most of Western society wiped out so they can have the land. It's an oriental mafia. And most of our leaders in D.C. aren't much better. I'm sick and tired of them going to places like Devos when they make secret plans against us while they come to us and say, I represent you. That's a lie. We need to understand that the whole world is running hard into darkness. It's not going to be as easy as it has been when Christianity was, when America was a Christian nation, that the, that the majority of us were believers and that they, we were praying and that, the, uh, that, our, that our Judeo-Christian heritage was really manifested in society. You know, it's, there was a time that Father Knows Best and Leave it to Beaver was actually an expression of most of society in America. Now it's modern family and a bunch of others. And even worse, we're in an uphill battle. The thing is, the church to a certain degree has always been in an uphill battle. But that's where we get strong. That's where our priorities begin to change. In fact, James had to deal with it in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. I think there needs to be a paradigm shift in our generation. It's not about how much you can accumulate. It's about how much good you can do for God while you're here. Now, James is writing to the church. He's not writing to the, 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 uh, the tavern down the road. He's writing to the church. Where do wars and fightings come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and, uh, and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Right now we have a church that is absolutely OCD about becoming culturally relevant. How can you be relevant to a culture that's going to hell except to be in stark contrast to that culture? And yet we're running out and they grow their hair sideways this way. All the next thing you know, everybody in the church is growing their hair sideways this way. Everybody runs out and gets tattoos and all kinds of weird stuff that's going on. Because we want the world to love us. If the world loves us, we're doing it wrong. James said it, that if you want friendship with the world, you're an enemy of God. John said the same thing. In 1 John. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes God, makes himself an enemy of God. Now what about that did we not understand?
You see, there was a time in America that, re that politicians didn't love the church. They feared the church. Because the church had enough numbers that we said, we're not going to tolerate that in our culture. And they knew that if they tried to force it, their careers were over. And I remember I had one drill sergeant when I was going through basic. And uh, I, did, I really did like him. He was an airborne ranger. One of the, he was chewing out a guy and the guy was crying. And he said, son... He said, you don't have to like me, but you better learn to fear me. Because he was telling him how the cow was going to chew the cabbage and welcome to the army. I'm not your mama. I'm not your daddy. I'm not your grandma. And here's a harsh reality. What was that drill sergeant moving in? Delegated authority. That the one that has sent me says... These are the rules, and you're going to abide by the rules. And if you don't, there'll be consequences, and I'm here to enforce the rules. Yet are we not ambassadors of Christ in the earth? Are we not the salt and light in the earth? And we have been asking for the world to love us when they should have learned to fear us the way that we're supposed to fear the Lord. So there, there needs to be this paradigm shift. We've, got, we've allowed too much of the world to get in. And I'm just as guilty as, as the next person. I, th I think some have, have learned to build a ministry by, by blowing kisses to the world. And that's a ministry that, you, I don't care if you could have 100,000 people on, on Sunday morning, they're all going to hell. Now there are many good churches out there that are preaching the gospel, that are teaching them, don't be of the world. And they can range from a, a church of 50 to a church of 5,000. There are a lot of good men of God out there that are doing it. But we need more of them. Because they're in the minority. It's not the best life now. It's not hyper grace gives me an excuse to be worldly and God's got to put up with it. God's grace separated me from the world. I'm not under their jurisdiction anymore. Could you see me as an American citizen writing to Putin, worried about how he felt about me? Are we friends? Are you cool with what I did this week? I'm not a citizen of his nation. I, I, we should not care what the world thinks. We should care what the king thinks, who has saved us and gave his life for us. And then gave us imaginable weapons. The power of his name. The power of his blood. The power of his word. His Holy Spirit has moved on the inside of us. To walk in the commandments of God. To be different than the world. So they can have a choice. How many know that you don't have a choice if you're going to go out to eat and you have a choice between Taco Bell and Taco Bell? No, you do if it's Taco Bell or Longhorn Steakhouse. That's a choice. Okay. And by the way, we're the Longhorn Steakhouse. The kingdom of God, the good place to eat. Okay. I'm not saying Taco Bell is, and I've eaten my fair share of Nacho Bell Grandes and all kinds of stuff over the years. They did break my heart when they quit the uh, volcano sauce. I like my stuff spicy. But can you see that we have, we have been lulled into a wrong paradigm? The early church knew that they were in contrast to everything else on planet Earth. And were willing to be that, and that's what caused the power to flow. And right now there is resistance to the power flowing because we're out of alignment. God's calling us back to an alignment. So God, I'm wanting to see the deaf hear and the blind see and the dead raised and the sinner run from his sin like his pants are on fire. I want to see that. And I want to see nations changed. And 
to become sheep nations even in the midst of the rise of the Antichrist. I want to see that. I want to have just a small part of maybe seeing that come to pass by, by equipping this next generation to get her done, you know. But we need to realize everything that happens is not the will of God. We have got to fight to establish the will of God in the earth. Because everything else is warring against it. Now, Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That we would understand the times in which we are living. So that we can fight the good fight of faith. And war to see your kingdom established in the lives of families and communities and even nations, Father. Because the only other choice is destruction. Because that king, he comes but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But only you come that we might have life and to have it abundantly. And Father, I ask that you would raise up warriors that would quit fighting for the things of the flesh and fight for you, Jesus. The fight for lost souls being saved and lives and communities changed. And Father, we thank you today and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The kingdom priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity. Revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible? And who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the principality's wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of the end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.